real father of our club was Jim LaRue, who was a lieutenant governor with the Cedar Falls Evening Club, and for several years had been asking me, why don't you come to the meetings? Why don't you come to the meetings? And I said, I never know what I'm doing on Thursday evening. I can't say that every Thursday evening I'm going to be available to go to a meeting. So then one day he came to me and said, would you be willing to try a morning club? <clears throat> and I said, yes, I would. Well, he also located about 20 other people who were the original members of this club. And we started a morning club in, I think, 1980. Does that sound correct? Sounds about right. Sounds about right. <laughs> in 1980, we, we had our first initial meeting. And we had enough people signed up that we chartered a club, a new club in Cedar Falls. And within probably a month or two, Lynn Schwant came to us with a fundraiser. His wife was very active in Campfire Girls, and the Campfire Girls had been trying to do newspaper recycling. And at that time, newspapers had some value in terms of recycling. There was pretty good money to be made in doing that. And we started out with a semi-trailer parked across from the um, McDonald's. McDonald's on Main Street, Main Street in Cedar Falls, the, the one on the south end, where Deary has a used vehicle lot now, but that was at that time just a vacant lot. And we had a semi in there, and every Saturday we would have people there, and we would open the back doors, and people would drive up, and we would we'd start stuffing that trailer. Once we got the trailer full, it would be hauled away and a new one would be brought in. Well, they weren't new, they were old wrecks of trailers. And we would start filling another one. And we did that for several years. Then the company that was buying the papers in Cedar Rapids said, we've got an idea, we'd like to just put some collection buildings in that people could just drive up and throw the newspapers in. So Dave Christensen and I, who Dave was an original member of the club, got a plan from the company in Cedar Rapids and we manufactured four buildings that would hold four Gaylords. Now a Gaylord is simply a box that fits on top of a pallet and we had opening doors on the ends of those buildings, they had a roof, they had open sides, people could just drive up, get out of their car, take their bundle of paper, throw it in one of the Gaylords, drive away. That worked great for about two years. And we were making pretty good money off that. Very good money. Very good money. It was paying us well, and we were then starting to do things within the community. And we'll talk about some of those things that that financed. But basically, that's where we started from, was that particular setting. Everything worked great until people got interested in burning our buildings down. And we had two or three of the buildings got burned during the night, and the fire department came to us and said, they're, uh, they're an, uh, an attractive nu nuisance. We can't have them anymore. We also had some problems with the places where we had them placed, like Hy-Vee and other places, saying, we don't want them in our lot anymore because <laughs> people simply burn them down. So, and plus, the, the paper market <coughs> went bad at that point. And so we ended up getting out of the paper business, which leads us to a couple of other little early things that we did. You want to take over? But I think, over? you know, we're probably the reason the city of Cedar Falls got started in recycling because they saw we were taking in, we were oh, making we good were, money yeah. and they were saying, hey, why should the service club get that money? We could do that as a city. So yeah. I think we were the impetus for them starting a recycling service. I've given you a sheet and on it is listed a bunch of things that we've done. We'd be happy to talk about any of those We'll talk about some, but if you have some you'd like to hear about, let us know. When did you do Chris Cakes of Ragbri? That was the first time Ragbri came through Cedar Falls. Remember and, the year? Oh gosh. I don't remember for sure when the first It was year probably was. in the eighties. Yeah, yeah, I would say nineteen eighties. So did, did, you, did you contract with the uh, Chris Cakes? Chris Cakes contacted us and said we need some people to help serve oh. and so what we were doing all we were doing was serving for Chris's cakes but a little interesting sideline on that was that uh, the people that had mini donuts would come over and eat Chris's cakes and Chris's cakes people would eat mini donuts in the morning <laughs> they were so sick of their own product <laughs> that 
but they, the they but rag Bri had its uh, headquarters around the dome so right. in the parking lot of the dome That's and on we the were. grass west of the dome there were hundreds of little igloo tents yep i can't say bikers. though that we ever made a, a whole lot of no. money that because most of the people would get on their bikes real early in the morning and go out about I don't know how far do you go out bicycle riders 15, 15 miles or whatever and get an hour. yeah yeah and then he yeah, first hour yeah. you <laughs> we, we did serve quite a few cakes but but it was not a big not a, a good fundraiser no, thing it, no. it was kind of a fizzle and we've had some others <laughs> we want to talk about one of the fiascos uh, one of our early events I think Dean can tell us more about that, but it was one of the <laughs> first about. years that Sturgis Falls met, and someone came up with the idea that we should charge to park cars at Island Park, and the city said, okay. Well, we got down there ready to <clears throat> charge people as they parked at Island Park, and Boy. tempers were pretty mm -hmm. high. <sighs> We got called everything in the book. <laughs> and they weren't good. No. <laughs> and I got called uh, to the mayor's office. Well, not to the mayor's office. He happened to be on the stand, on the speaker's stand or whatever, and they called me to that, and he said, you can't charge for people to park on the city property? <laughs> oh, okay. Well, <laughs> that ended that, but it's sure a hell of a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> it sounded like a real money maker. <laughs> yeah, it did. And our well, first we've seen it done in other places yeah. and uh, well, the cities that, cooperate and so forth. And if, if you've ever been to the old Tressers reunion down at Mount Pleasant, mm -hmm. I mean, it costs you 10 bucks to park for the day. I mean, so. But that's different. Um, our first money fundraiser at Sturgis was Watermelon Stand on Island Park. And we you talk bought, about fiascos. That was we talk, We bought a truckload of watermelons, and we had a truckload of watermelons <clears throat> left after. <laughs> we sold maybe ten watermelon slices, and so that was not a good one. We lost a little money on that one. A lot of times we've learned over the years that. Location, location, yeah. location is very, of all your realtors, that uh, depending on where you're selling your watermelon or your kettle corn or whatever, uh, we did the... Uh, it's regular the, popcorn for many Yeah, years. the Irish Fest, and we wound up on, we were so far away, I'd have binoculars to see the, the, you know, the stand where they were singing and so forth. And we gave it up along with the, the guy who was selling pizza it was right beside us. I swear to God, he maybe Dominance. sold two pieces of pizza the whole whole time he was there. And we may have sold a couple bags of couple kettle corn. Bags, yeah. Found that beer and kettle corn, not a good mix. So Another one of our fiascos, since you like to talk about fiascos, <laughs> the city parks department came to us about our third or fourth year. And they were just at that time developing Birdsell Park, Birdsell area. And they said, we've got this thing where we would like to have you go out and sell trees to people. And everybody will have their own tree. And you can come 20 years later and bring your grandchildren and you show your grandchildren your tea, the tree that you purchased and put in here. So we went out and we canvassed and we did everything. And about two years later, we asked them, well, we've never seen the drawing, the plat for where our trees are. Uh, we lost it. So here we had all these people that we'd sold them on the fact that they were going to have their own personal tree. And so then what we had to tell them was, well, you go out there and pick a tree. <laughs> and that'll be your tree. And you can bring your grandchildren out and show them the, the tree that you planted for Cedar Falls. In addition to that, we did we did help with the planting. So yes. It, yeah. Yeah. See some of those trees out at Birdsville Park. We had we dug the to holes to put them in. Not to this day, my daughter thinks she knows where her tree is. Yeah, where her tree is, yeah. So... I've never taken my grandchildren out there. So where were they planted? <laughs> they were planted there, but they well, didn't have the there? record of whose tree, whose tree you know was whose. You know where the softball diamond is? Yes. Between there and the road, there's kind of little angle corners to the west that's of filled the with trees. Uh, on 12th Street. Yeah, yeah. yeah on, on, west on 12th. 12th. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Speaking of that also, though, uh, one of the things that we have done that has really gone well and we really haven't been known for is the disc golf course oh, yes. uh, the city wanted to put in a 
this golf course had no money. Well, I think we contributed five grand for that. Yeah. We didn't do any for work the, with the it. They put it in, but it has really been a popular place. And didn't they get the um, the golf course because somebody went to a conference yes. and they wanted the, the head of the of the parks department had gone to a conference and he won this disc golf course. So then they come back and now they're trying to figure out where are they going to put it, and they didn't have the money to install it. So we raised the money to to put it in. Um, after they pulled out the railroad that came down past the old golf Cedar <coughs> College golf course and down through there, they came to us and said, we want to convert that into a bicycle path, but we've got to make those bridges safe. And so we've spearheaded the first bridge and went out and actually tore the railroad ties and everything off, built the decking, put the deck on, put the siding on, rails. The side rails on, had to do them to specification for the DNR and uh, I made all of the iron work for that bridge and then uh, the um, Lions did the second bridge, the next bridge over, and I made all the iron work for that bridge. So we had a direct impact on that. If you ever go out on the bicycle trail and we still have a sign that says Kiwanis Crossing that's there because we did the first one and pioneered that and so then they did several others. But yeah, that was all part of our early, early things we were doing. Those are some of the great things we did. Mm -hmm. We had some downers too. If Jerry Slykus was here, he would tell yeah. you one of the biggest downers we ever did was to help a lady in Waverly build <laughs> coon cages so she could rehabilitate injured <laughs> raccoons. <laughs> to Jerry, that was a negative, negative 10. <laughs> He just couldn't figure out why we why did we it. Were, yeah, why we were trying to keep raccoons alive. <laughs> yeah. That writes probably with uh, another project we've done, and that is painting the privies for the city. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what other club can be known for painting the privies out of them? We did them at the lakes, South Lakes, and we did them on uh, Big, Woods. Big Woods Lake too, north of the lake, south of the lake. And it wasn't easy. Have you ever tried to paint rough cement with a roller? It doesn't work easy. You got to have gobs and gobs and gobs of paint to get the roller to get anything on there, and then you still have to brush in the, the little corners. So they still that, look good. That was a tough, tough job. Don't smell good. Can you tell them about their work with Rotary Reserve? <laughs> The fact we, that the Quanians went out to fix the Rotary Reserve. We've done a couple of things at the mm -hmm. Rotary Reserve. Uh, yeah. One of the things we did was help with the haunted house mm -hmm. to get it. The first year that they created it, we went out and, and helped them a bit with setting that up. And one of the things we did was uh, to build a, a ramp. Of, On both sides. Yeah. A wheel, a, an input and an output. Yeah, like a wheelchair ramp to input and output ramp. and. The first question Nick and I asked was, is there anything down there when we dig a hole to put this post in there? And no, no, there's nothing around here. The second hole, up comes the water. We, oh, we no. dug right through right it. the water line. Water line. <laughs> oh yeah, there is a water, water line there. here. Yeah, I forgot about that. <laughs> we also helped uh, the Rotary Reserve House, when they, you know, I don't know what they call that, the, the meeting building. The meeting or, place. Yeah. They did some remodeling and we did a lot of uh, drywalling and mudding of drywall mm -hmm. and that sort of thing and for for the changing the walls. That did was a some, whole new addition, wasn't it? Yeah. Like they, yeah. they doubled the they doubled the, the footy the the footprint. They doubled it and we did all the drywall work on the inside of that. We always thought it was kind of interesting that here we are, Kiwanis Group, doing work for the Rotary. But yeah, right. <laughs> we did it. Oh, no, that's... And at Hartman Reserve, of course, we have done many projects out there. And one of them <clears throat> that Marvin and I remember very well was when they came back and said, well, they won't approve the building unless we drywall the basement. <laughs> and that's of the sugar shack. Yeah, this is of the sugar shack when they, when they built it. And we had to go in and drywall it after all the plumbing and heat runs and everything were in. It, normally you would go in and before you put all that stuff in, you'd do your drywall. 
So here we are trying to cut around pipes and fit around ductwork and plus the plumber uh, didn't think it was going to be drywall, so, so he, he just, just hung the plumbing, you know, any out. which way and every which way. <laughs> you ne you've never seen so many little pieces of drywall cut and fit in, and uh, plus yeah. we drywalled the side walls, which were the the yeah. footings are the styrofoam styrofoam with a plastic plastic with a strip for screwing the drywall to and filling with concrete, you know, for the for the basement walls, which and, was a new experience. Well, and they didn't pay any attention because they didn't think it was going to be drywall, so they didn't pay any attention to whether those strips lined up. Yeah, So right. you'd be going, you'd be putting in screws, and all of a sudden you wouldn't have any, it would be styrofoam. So then you'd have to hunt and find where the next strip was. Oh, we spent hours down in that basement. They I'm, finally got it approved, though. On your sheet, you'll notice there's a number of things we've done for Hartman Reserve and for the Blackhawk uh, County uh, conservation. conservation. Yeah. Uh, we we put together a bunch of uh, picnic Boating, tables for yeah. them out at the conservation. Like a hundred of them. <laughs> yeah, right. So it was it was a lot of tables. The yeah. Osprey Tower was a real interesting one. How high was that thing? Oh yeah, the Hacking Tower. Are you familiar with the Osprey Hacking Tower? About 40 <laughs> feet in the air. They want the new hatchlings to be able to see the lake like they would from their nest. So it had to be up in the air because they come back and go to that same location to see that same vision in their mind. So we built a hacking tower 40 feet in the air a little shack on top of a platform that they went up and fed the new ospreys through a little hole in the wall so they wouldn't see them. They had a special glove that looked like the head of an osprey. And yeah, and they, they feed, feed, feed them. And so they reintroduced ospreys here. So then when the osprey project died, they decided they wanted that to become an observation platform. So Marvin and I went out and we <laughs> hauled two by fours up that hacking tower, which went in a spiral as you went around. And we took the, the building off the top and converted it into an observation platform. And that took us two or three days we were up there playing on top of the hacking tower. I think the hacking tower is down now, isn't it? I don't uh, no, know. Part, no, it's still there. It's, it's still there? You yeah. can't find it. But they won't let you up on it. Oh, OK. They yeah. just don't let you get up there. Kind of a surprise that they were going to actually turn it into an observation yeah. deck with safety and all that. Yeah, right. Yep. But they did. We, for several mm -hmm. years, it was just an observation deck. I think we could run through a few of the things that we've done for Hartman and the Blackhawk County. I want to tell you about one anyway. Hey, uh, <laughs> one of the things we did was out at Blackhawk Park, we helped put in a playground. Yes. One of those, you know, that has okay. slides and all that sort of stuff. We we assembled that and put it in the ground, cemented it in, and that sort of thing. Next to that, there was a uh, shelter that had laminated beams and all of that thing, and we ended up uh, shingling that. But I have a side story. Uh, I was supposed to meet Steve Harding out there by that new shelter. So I drove out in my pickup, and I knew Steve had a red car. I didn't see any red car by the shelter, but there was a red car over in the parking lot over to the east. So I thought, that must be Steve. What's he doing over there? So I drove over there, pulled up beside, on the driver's side of that car, got out of my pickup, went over and looked I couldn't see anybody in the car, so I got over and looked in the window of the car, and it wasn't Steve Harding. It was a young couple doing, just use your imagination of what they were doing. That's what they were doing. So I politely get, walked around my pickup, got back in, and drove off. I, he always told me it was Steve in there. No, it wasn't, no, it wasn't Steve. I, I'll swear it wasn't yeah. Steve. <laughs> But we have done a number of things for Hartman Reserve. Uh, the deck we built on the north side of Hartman is now gone. Dean will 
verify that we built that in two foot high poison ivy. Yes. Solid poison ivy. Yeah, after after the first day of working there, I went and got my shot for poison ivy. Yeah. Uh, it was definitely poison ivy. Yeah. So, but that was a, you know very successful projects. I think a lot of people use that observation because you once you walked out on, I mean, it was a drop off off that hill or cliff or whatever you want to call it. So, one of the one of the things though that is down here is a fiasco. It started out or wasn't really a fiasco, but I don't know. Maybe someone would like to talk about the uh, color. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you going to speak to that? Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> um, Dave got the bright idea of doing a color run, and it um, was for the Eliminate Project. Brought in the other clubs in the district to work on it. Um, the first year it was fantastic. Um, yeah. We had a large number of runners. Uh, started it started and ended at Gateway Park. Um, beautiful weather. It had been hot and humid and turned out 70 degrees and beautiful that day. Um, it was great. Everybody went home very colorful. Yeah. Second Does everybody year, know what a color run is? Yeah. Uh, maybe. Okay. Um, second year, uh, nobody signed up. We had all the plans made, had all the bananas and the bagels there, um, yeah, and had very few runners. So first year it was great. I think it was another one of those things that had gained popularity every place, and there were just others of them that they did not. Uh, well, I remember they were having one at Hawkeye Tech, and I mean, they're having them all over because they were profitable fundraisers. but. After the first first year, it was kind of a, a steep slope downhill. Yeah. You know. I think we made a, a fair amount of money that first year. Um, I can't remember how much, but it, it was well over a thousand dollars. You might point out that there's a video of it on the website. And uh, one of the, as the popcorn. We'd been in the popcorn business for many, many years. In fact, back in the 90s, we would do uh, popcorn at the Dixieland Jazz. We would we had a building, or I shouldn't say a building, we had a kiosk at the Ice House Museum on the east side. All through Dixieland, we would have people manning that and we would be popping regular popcorn. We started out just with Dave Christensen and I sitting down there with a popcorn machine plugged in and making corn and selling it to the people who were viewing the Dixieland bands going on. Uh, even we expanded then to the parade. We would gear up and actually take wagons, and you, you remember this well. Oh yeah, I remember. Because uh, you and Jerry used to go out with your little wagon and they would work the people who were waiting for them. Everything would be fine. I would go down at five in the morning and when John Dutcher built his building for his paint business, he actually put an outlet on the outside of that building for us. Because I would go down at five o'clock in the morning on the day of the parade and I would start popping popcorn and putting it in big bags. And I would pop right up until the parade started and then I would shut down and clean up and, and go. But John actually put an outlet on the outside of his building just so we could plug our, our popper in. Because originally we would go in through his overhead door and plug in and do our popcorn. So we did that for it, probably 10, 12 years. And another part of it was then we would go and we would, uh, I can't remember what's what's the one on university, they'd give us stock oh, tanks, yeah. a loan of stock tanks, and we'd put those on top yeah. of wagons and we'd pull those baby around. I mean, and sell water and sell pop. There, and, you know, yeah. Early in the morning and we would ice those down and so we'd go around with those tanks when they had popcorn, popcorn. boxes and and what he was referring to is that the parade went yes. on Main Street, and Jerry and I were pulling a, a stock tank full of, I mean, full of, full of pop, ice, that type of thing. And it happened to be a curve uh, going on onto Main Street. And well, I guess I was in front, but anyway, I was pulling the, the wagon. And since that tank is on a little, a little wagon, 
the minute you turn it, you got to be very careful that thing will fall over. Well, use your imagination. We spilled it. that whole thing right on the corner of Main Street. And here we are, we're out there picking up pop, et cetera, and so forth. But I tell you what, we probably got the biggest applause of anything that was in the parade. So. The things that I've handed out have been in my basement for too long. But the, a little known, unbelie absolute unbelievable fact about this club is we used to sing. Can yes. you believe it? Listen to us now when we, when we try, do whatever we do to... Dennis Downs was one of our initial members, and he was the uh, orchestra instructor at the high school. And so he made a recording, and I don't even know what happened to the recording. I have the recording. You, you think that'll help? <laughs> I don't think it'll help. I don't think you can find a cassette player in it, but I, I do have one. Lou, I did Lou, play it. Lou McIntyre is the pianist on that recording, yeah. Kent McIntyre. And Kent McIntyre was an original member of this club. He was a librarian at Price Laboratory School. And uh, Lou, had, they made the recording, and for many years we would punch the button on the recorder and we would sing to piano music as we opened the, opened our programs. But we also just, you know, Cornus yeah. has a singing we tradition a, in, in the evening club saying at every meeting. Did we you, sang once in a while. Did but, you bring examples of the songbook in? Yes. I, okay, I say it. Somewhere we've got 30. Please take them books. home so I don't have to take them back. <laughs> Yeah, it's kind of interesting. The, I'm sorry. Go ahead. The other thing I've handed out is some of the old uh, uh, what, what, what do we call our little directory, and if Gary Deaver was here, I'd, he'd love to see some of the older versions yes. of the directory. We've come a long way. Our directory has improved, but I thought you might like to see some of the people who used to be members here. We've had a, we have quite an alumni of people, people who have been, been members and have since retired. For various reasons, or, they move on. Right? And moved, right. moved away. To, uh, but there's a number of old directories here, and you'll see some of the names in there. This used to be an all male organization. Yes, yeah, originally. Right. I don't know when we started allowing female members, um, probably in about well, 1990. In the 90s. Um, I think Karen Page Karen was one Page of our is, first yeah. uh, females, yeah. and then the superintendent's wife around the same time. Yeah. She didn't stay very long. Karen stayed for a while. Yeah. Just a <coughs> comment on, uh, on number four of the Legacy Art Community Service Project. We have built eight shelters at the, the uh, soccer complex uh, to include a great big storage shed that's there. This the, Apparently the uh, Cedar Valley soccer people had, with all the garbage can or waste cans they had around the, the complex, the city said that they had to store those. And uh, so we basically built them a place that half of it could be for storage, and I think the other half is probably for equipment and, and so forth. But uh, I think that, I don't know, I'm, I'm trying to think how, who was our uh, people that helped supply the cement for the foundations. Uh, oh, Martin's and Martin's, construction. Yeah, mm -hmm. they were very good in helping us out and we did get a couple uh, financial grants, one through John Deere and one through the uh, gaming, yeah, gaming Commission, commission which was, were a lot of help, but also a lot of those were built basically by our own funds. So We, all, we also, Shields uh, paid for one of them. That's yes. right, yeah. And there are a couple other uh, organizations that uh, picked it up. Mm -hmm. We also Quantum had a Yeah, Columbus Foundation did one. Yeah. Can you tell us any interesting stories about the building of the the work over there at the soccer field? Nick Nick Tig and I kept up our tradition. The we, one. Yeah. You know, we'll tell you about that yeah. later. Yeah. But <laughs> the the one right on the uh, south side of the creek by the bridge. The second hole we dug, we hit the water line again. Yeah. They didn't know there was a water. It's, you know, with the sprinkler system, but we drilled right into it. The other one is the crookedest shelter we ever built. We had it laid out, and then they they decided. I think there's a 
electrical line under there. So they came and they moved it. And we never squared it up again after that. And when we, that building is about six inches out. <laughs> yeah, about six inches out of square. But. And I remember when we put that on there, Nick just said, no problem, and he just got the, the, uh, the saw. <laughs> yeah. Made it so it fit. <laughs> yep. But the guys who did the cement, you know, laid the cement under, they, tr they tried to saw yeah. the cement square, and he says, what, what in the yeah, world is going on here? <laughs> the cement well, wasn't square. Well, I would start out in the middle of the post on the one <laughs> side and, and miss the post on the other side. <laughs> But other than that, the others are square. Yeah. I guarantee you. Yeah. Actually, a, a famous quote came up in all our building and so forth. Uh, I don't know, maybe Nick could, well, I'll speak to it. <laughs> I wouldn't do it that way. <laughs> Nick would say, uh, you know, I wouldn't do it that way, but you can go ahead and do, do it. it. <laughs> so it meant that, oop, better go back and take a look. <laughs> Well, the time they came around the corner with the, the on the shed we built to put the cans in, up by their where their equipment building is, and they're they all four inches on the one corner. And you, we can't do that. <laughs> we can't have the building four inches out of plumb. So, made them take it off, take it all off, square it up, put it back on. They grumbled a little. But. That shelter was not square, but the worst shelter we ever built was the one where the city required us to have oh, an architect yeah. design yes. it. Yes. <laughs> not that. Not that architect. Not, <laughs> not that architect. The the shelter at the daycare center in North Cedar. They made us put cement pillars in the ground with a little flimsy. Metal. metal bracket on top and then the shelter on top of there and we were up on the roof and you got seasick because it swung so bad it, it, with nothing in the ground you know to stabilize it it just it was loose it was scary yeah. anyway if we hadn't they wanted a sort of a fence around it so we put some bracing and fencing and corner bracing in and that's what firm secured it, it a little bit but that was the worst shelter we yeah, ever it was, built. It was scary to be on the roof. How about when we built playgrounds? I know we did one over in Island Park, I believe it is. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, well, right. no, we did the no, one no. at uh, Blackhawk Park. Blackhawk Park. Blackhawk Park. Blackhawk yeah. Park. Uh, and but, we should just mention some other shelters we did. We did a shelter on the bike trail down yes. by the hacking tower somewhere down there. Yeah, I, we I did one down in there. Called yeah. on North Hackett or somewhere yeah. down in there. Uh, out at Blackhawk Park, one of the first things we built on the bike trail was a little kiosk area that it just has so, a roof over it. And so if I, you're out there riding, you got caught in the rain, you had a place to go into yeah, and get under. And so. It's kind of at a crossroad yeah. out there at the park. But we also built a shelter out there, plus the one that I mentioned. That there's a picture of that somewhere. I and uh, someone standing on the shelter. By the way, there are some memorabilia pictures circulating. Keep them going around, and you can see some of those things that the we've North done. The North Cedar project was kind of interesting. The, the one that the, we built probably within the last what three or four years oh yeah in the park in north cedar yeah. yeah yes getting the beams up and finding out that uh, we were well we had the city involved too low. again <laughs> yeah <laughs> well the beams were so heavy that we ended up going to benton and yeah, having getting, him uh, come over yeah. and use his lift hand loader hand loader, loader, yeah. hand loader to, to them lift them up because they were unbelievably heavy that shelter is built so it could withstand an atomic bomb blast. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, now they, they used my solution on that. <laughs> I said, all you have to do is dig a foot down, just take out a foot of dirt. And that's what they did. They eventually came in and took a foot of dirt out. Because I said, the water will run out the end, it won't be any problem. So, well, the strange thing is, Steve Harding was constantly talking with them, trying to have them tell us, what do you want done with this thing? And he couldn't get any answer from anybody. And then, so we went out there and we went to work on it. And why are you doing it that way? So, we found out. Tell, tell us about the transition from all our fundraisers to kettle corn. How did that all 
Well, it started out, uh, as it mentions in here, that uh, Keith Sandbold, who has a sporting goods shop, he and his partner bought the trailer, and they would go around to these big farm shows, and they had the the, uh, the machinery and so forth to print the T-shirts and so forth for the farm show. And they thought it would be, you know, have another little stand right beside it, and they would sell kettle corn. And I think it was pretty profitable for them, except the manpower that it takes to run that is unbelievable, as most of us know. So he got to the point where they were just tired of it, I think, and, and he had mentioned something to Jerry Sykes, and uh, Jerry, I don't know, actually was, was thinking maybe it would be a project for his son to make some money to go to college, but then he thought, I think he thought too, oh my gosh, the amount of work and so forth it's going to take, and so he brought it up to the Qantas group. And lo and behold, we decided that we would get into the kettle core business, because I don't think really any of us like selling waffle tickets, <laughs> which is our project prior to, uh, to the kettle corn. But uh, that's basically how we got into it. Uh, uh, we've gone through one popper. Our, our first popper is in Illinois. Freeport, Illinois. Freeport. Yeah, Lynn Schwant and his group bought that. I don't know if they're still using it or not. Uh, but. Yeah, I'm familiar with that because I had an uncle in that club, and, and they got tired of cranking, so they bought a new one that cranks itself. Is that right? <laughs> they got a self-cranker. What a wonderful idea. <laughs> the poppers were made by a fellow who lives at Phillips, Nebraska, right. just east of Grand Island. He was a popcorn distributor and he made and sold the kettle corn machines as well. The first couple of years, we were convinced that his popcorn was the only kind that would really work good for kettle corn. So we made a couple of trips in pickups with a pickup and got a couple ton of popcorn, popcorn from Phillips, Nebraska. We used uh, Phil Hubbard's pickup one year uh, that I went, and a nice sideline was we got to see the Sand Hill Cranes. <laughs> you and I were out there yeah. once, yeah. But we picked up the popcorn at Phillips, Nebraska. That's that. That was where the, the um, what's his name had bought the the machine originally was from there, and so that's yeah, right, we had the right. name of that where it was manufactured. But I think part of the history of this is we went from, did it, was it 10 cents a bag popcorn yeah. Yeah. to 15 cents a bag popcorn, maybe 25 cents a bag popcorn, and now we're selling the smallest bag of kettle corn for three bucks. Yeah. It's a lot different. Uh, Things have changed. We, we plied the crowds pretty, pretty heavily during the jazz festival, carrying a little box of popcorn. Our, our competitor sold peanuts, yes, yes, <laughs> right. remember? Yeah. And, yeah, from the Radio Relay League. Yeah, yeah. right. I'll throw out from our last meeting, by the way, from the uh, meeting and regarding to the kettle corn and the selling and the, you know, getting sponsorship and so forth, something to think about is we're probably not going to be doing this for I don't know how many years because it takes so many people and I just look around that many of you are my age or older and uh, so it becomes a question what happens to our club when we don't have something like making kettle corn. Uh, I think we've kind of reached the point where our monkeys that used to get up on the buildings and you know go on the rafters and Harding would be going from beam to beam and we put the roof on those things and so forth so a number of us have said I'm not going up on the roof again anymore I've you know, I'm done with that, but just from the standpoint of what does that do to our club when we don't have a project or we don't have something to bring us together, and really I I look at it that uh, when we're cooking the kettle corn and so forth, it's a social event. You know, sometimes we get tired of the social event, <laughs> but anyway, it's Sometimes you get cranky. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But anyway, you know, it's just something to think about. Let's say in five years we don't want to do kettle corn any longer. What happens to our club? 
please, let's don't do anything where we have to sell tickets. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, just something to think about, I guess. We don't do well at that. Well, I, uh, it's time, but I just want to say uh, thank you very much for the three of you uh, spending the time talking about this. But I think when we think about it, the, the heritage of this club, the activities that it's done, the contributions it's made to this community, uh, the people that are no longer here that made a great deal of difference for this club. I think we can all celebrate that together. So let's give these people a hand and all the people that are one, one thing we didn't talk about was the Cedar Falls Library back when they were transitioning from into the new building. We did a lot of work for the Cedar Falls Library mm -hmm. too. We, we completed the room that's their production room for their TV down there. We, we did that. Paid for their first computer. Paid for their first. I got computer. the best one of the best compliments. You no, know, one of the only compliments I've ever gotten on my work. Alice Bullers was at the top of the ladder and upset her whole pail of paint right on the floor, and had my uh, drop cloths down. And she says, "Marv Heller has good drop cloths because it didn't soak so through good. to the carpeting." <laughs> and I still have that big blotch on my drop cloth. Well, uh, I got some. We got to get some uh, some gifts. Do you want to golf balls? You're the only golfer here. I hate to use, I use some good golf balls because they usually wind up in a water. So, <laughs> <laughs> but I'll take it. You what would some, you guys like? You got some used golf anything. balls you could give me? <laughs> I, I probably do with my bag. <laughs> I'll trade these off uh, and give you my old ones. Yeah, right. Gonna, <laughs> Uh, what we use old ones? I have some old ones. You know. Cup, cup is fine. I don't. Yeah. I, don't I, don't, I really don't need either one. But, <laughs> okay. Well, give, well, give but we else. do thank the new members for joining us. It is a one of the hardest things to do in a club is to recruit new members, and thank for joining us because. Yeah. But we'd be dead without it. Get, get but think people. about it if you've been Please don't put it that younger. way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, There's only one way out. That's right. <laughs>